I love industry. Nothing says prosperity like the rumbling of locomotives and the blasting of gunpowder. <laughs> Chaos dwarves understand me. They appreciate the intricacies of infrastructure and production. Which is why today we will be entering into a world which is sadly lacking in choo-choo and bang-bang, so that we may spread the gospel of pistons and pistols to the diesel disadvantaged and the blasting bereft. Can you imagine a more fortuitous circumstance than being visited by a derailed train covered in cannons and spikes, crewed by cursed, furious, short men? First things first, and that's getting situated in our new role as commander of Chaos Cursed Conductors. Taking a quick look at the world map, many locations are immediately recognizable, which means we're somewhere right around here. This makes it pretty clear what our biggest issue in life will immediately be. Communist Neighbors Communists make terrible neighbors. They smell, they steal, and if there's one thing you can be sure of about communists, it's that they hate prosperity. This makes them natural enemies for our forward-thinking, if not somewhat stunted friends, the Chaos Dwarves. It won't be long before they attempt to seize our means of production, so we'll have to act fast to ensure that this does not come to pass. Before we reach the Cathayan Collectivist Cohort, we have to deal with some non-conformist northerners. We attach our lieutenant to our army and head off to our first battle. These guys are all brawn and no brains, but we've only got a single unit of bullet bestowers. We'll have to plan carefully, but these guys are not messing around. The game attempts to seduce us into losing more units than necessary by offering an appealing auto-resolve result. Worse than simple inefficiency, auto-resolving means missing out on the gratification of watching the enemy be emulsified by our superior firepower. <laughs> Although we begin this campaign with only one unit of gunpowder gurus, their labor shall be the rock upon which our church is built. Alongside our blunderbuss brutalizers are two units of ordinary Chaos Dwarf warriors, some goblins both mounted and on foot, and of course, our heroes. Our unassuming band quickly closes ranks, and while the primitive Northmen struggle to penetrate our defensive lines, our ranged units liberally distribute instructions to stop living. Oh, and have I mentioned that we have rocket artillery? If there's one thing that currently alive creatures do not enjoy, it is being exploded by a rocket. The Norskin tribe quickly realizes that Zatan the Black is no pushover, at which point we pivot from battle mode to labor recruitment mode and start chasing them down. Unsurprisingly, long Norskin legs outpace tiny dwarf stumps, but Zatan brought a net. The Norskin leader realizes that our hero has outpaced his even slower underlings and thinks he's tough enough for a scrap. Unfortunately for him, we shoot him in the face with a rocket to death. Now that our battle is concluded, we acquire new employees for our child-friendly subterranean exploration opportunity. In our minds, we guarantee a true minimum wage to all our associates. Zero dollars per forever. When I said the labor of our blunderbusses was important, I meant the slave labor of the few people who survive being volley-fired into Swiss cheese. Seeing no reason to waste a perfectly good turn, we immediately continue to our first settlement battle. With our forces slightly depleted and our enemies possessing a greater variety of unit types, one might imagine that this battle would be slightly more difficult than the last. However, we slapped their cavalry with rockets, we immolated their leader, and once they got close, we introduced these cavemen to Napoleonic line warfare. After spending a prolonged period standing in what you might call an uncomfortable position, it occurred to the enemy that melee combat might be a better idea than cosplaying as Norwegian target dummies. In response to this surprisingly brilliant tactical attempt, we maneuvered behind them and performed a move I like to call the Stop Resisting, You're Under Arrest. After a thorough pummeling both up close and from afar, the enemy once again decides that having a hole the size of a beagle exploded out of your chest is less preferable than not having that happen. 
and vacates the battlefield. We have secured our first province, and now the plan to bring trains to Cathay are in locomotion. Before we can run communists over with trains, we must have trains. Before we can have trains, we must construct the buildings which enable their creation. Unfortunately, my advisors tell me that building trains requires a lot of gold, a lot of arms, and a lot of raw materials. We now enter a new phase of the campaign in which we must aggressively slap the bejesus out of every neighbor we have until we've shaken enough gold, coal, and weapons out of their pockets to build the world's first rail yard. Our conquest begins as we besiege a neighboring settlement. The tribe, apparently emboldened by a new toy, decide to sally out and meet us in the field rather than do the honorable thing and let us starve them to death. Desperate to slow our rapid expansion, the auto-resolve calculator decides to try a new approach and threatens us with catastrophic defeat. This motivates us greatly. Although there is still only a single unit of shotgun samurais to carry the team, we also have a new trick up our sleeve. Having begged not to be shipped off to the mines, a portion of our slave labor population are generously obliged and awarded with a new occupation being a wall of flesh that distracts insane barbarians who can't resist hacking away at them. Because this battle was dubiously initiated by a single lord and the rest of the enemy soldiers are arriving as reinforcements, we have the opportunity to set up at the edge of the map before they have time to get comfortable. We hurriedly arrive just in time to greet them with a charging mass of naked orcs. Frankly, I think we need to have a talk with whoever armed our slave soldiers, because those weapons look nasty as hell. The Northmen think they're being funny by bringing their own artillery to bear against us, which infuriates Zatan so grievously that he personally wades through the sea of suspiciously underdressed Scandinavians and smacks the demon right out of their undeserved hell cannon. Meanwhile, our single blunderbuss squad somehow goes unmolested while they work their way down the enemy line, disbanding enemy units faster than could be done on the campaign screen when trying to make room for my army of trains. Tired of being shot, stabbed, crushed, burned, and made fun of at school, the surviving Norskin warriors decide to explore a career in dandelion gardening instead and calmly walk off. With nothing left other than fertilizer and regret, the auto-resolver has no choice but to offer us very generous terms for the siege, which we absolutely accept as an act of dominance. Now we begin our expansion in earnest, putting the fear of Thomas the Tank back in the heathen Northlands. Our technologically befuddled North Bend neighbors are first on the chopping block. As we proceed through their territories, handing out corporal and capital punishments, we convert their former settlements into factories and mines to fill with our burgeoning child labor population. We also begin construction on the relevant military infrastructure. The first significant recruitment will be the Castellan, who enables our armies to move further. This movement buff is quite important, as these chaos wastelanders are extremely annoying to chase down and phenomenally adept at eluding our government cramps for publicly funded beatdowns. One by one, the Norskin tribes become nothing more than fossils, which we then convert into fossil fuels to power our war machines. On rails crafted from the bones of our fallen enemies, we forge ahead towards a subjugated north, all in the name of setting a staging ground for our incursion into Cathay. As we proceed with crushing our enemies, we take every measure we can to maximize our profiteering, as the infrastructure needed to build the tracked instruments of doom is exorbitantly expensive. Before long, we have secured all of the north and finally begun production of our beloved batteries. The final days of socialistic sadism are drawing near. In a hilarious twist of fate, just as the conquered Norskins were pleading for mercy, Grimgore Ironhide declares war on us during our most ambitious and aggressive period of expansion. As any strategist worth his salt would recommend, we chose to completely and entirely ignore that the orc problem even exists. It turns out that this strategy does not work. 
In the name of some unholy alliance between communism and being green, Grimgore races to the preemptive defense of Cathay and makes a beeline directly for our capital settlement in an attempt to cut our campaign short. By the skin of our teeth, we arrive in the capital in time to discourage him from finishing us off. However, we did not avoid taking losses altogether, and we will have to go through the effort of reclaiming at least one settlement. Now that the war has reoriented westward, I suppose there's really no reason we can't take a little detour to acquire more slaves and resources. It makes more sense than continuing towards our final enemy on the eastern flank, since that would simply leave us trapped in a war on two fronts. Unfortunately, most of what is west of us is nothing but ruins, an effective implementation of Scorched Earth policy by Grimgore. Rather than making a video about my experience of wandering through Grimgore's sloppy seconds for a thousand years, or running back and forth between Village the Naked Mole Rat and Grimgore the Green Gorilla Gladiator, it seems a cheesier approach may be warranted. Since what takes years for me in gameplay takes mere seconds for you, the viewer, to watch, I prostrate myself before the altar of the algorithm and sacrifice hundreds of hours of my life slowly building up my infrastructure with only a few settlements worth of income, transforming my tortured withering into an entertaining few seconds montage for strangers to gawk at. As the turns roll by, we find ourselves slowly piecing together our locomotive league until finally, it is ready. We have what Richard Trevithick could only dream of, free range trains. Given all this buildup leading to our anticipated invasion of Cathay, it would really grind my gears if we get interrupted by another sideswiping band of uppity orcs. An army equipped with our less train-like armaments is dispatched towards Grimgore's territory to communicate our refund policy in detail. The primary means of communication will be our magma cannons which unlike Mythbusters Archimedes heat ray our death ray doesn't seem to be working. I'm standing right in it, and I'm not dead yet. Makes far away things very hot, quite successfully. The orcs put up a nasty fight, but six magma cannons is more than enough to rotisserie their retinues. Each cannon targets a different orc ranged unit and fries it, while our fancy new riflemen rapidly disintegrate the orcs who prefer to get up close and personal. Our beastly bull centaurs meet the enemy cavalry on the flank and pursue their end with such prejudice that the orcs skip being ghosts and are transported directly to non-existence. Most of the time, Grimgore doesn't give a hoot whether his army is succeeding or failing, routing or whether they're even still alive, since he's too busy pulling spines out of living creatures and batting infantry like he's trying for the home run world record. Grimgore is surprised when his health begins dropping unusually fast, and decides to give running away a try for once, but is unfortunately surprised by the sudden arrival of our best friend since turn one, a gnat. With the help of our fire glaives, which are kind of like longer ranged blunderbusses, even the most rock solid enemy units and heroes begin to melt. Realizing that our company refund policy is more work than it's worth, the orcs decide to go away. With Grimgore admitted to the ICU for missing 99% of his insides, now we're quite ready to focus our attention on Cathay. The communists have been listening to my monologuing about their demise for several days now. The roads! You must drive on the roads! You must hate the roads! And they figure they might we as well declare war on me first, and at this point, hey, fair enough. Happily accepting their invitation to visit, we dip our toes in with an incomplete train set to test their strength. Cathay's northern border is protected by three enormous gates intended to discourage uninvited guests from wandering around their territory window shopping for new settlements. However, Cathay completely undermined this suggestion when they initiated involuntary exchanges of violence, so here we are. This army is created of some units that aren't trains, but we don't want to wait forever while that final army is created. We must first test the strength of our enemies by bringing a little experimental rendezvous to their outermost defenses. Cathay's architectural signature is secretly substituting proper building materials with cheap alternatives. While this strategy may have allowed them to quickly construct these visually impressive barriers on their northern borders, it is our duty to the world 
as builders and engineers to tear down these high-rise imposters so that new, proper construction can emerge in its place. We finally kick off our invasion with a casual game of teardown while our infantry storm the walls. Fierce fighting ensues on the battlements and in the streets below as our magma cannons punish the shoddy construction in the most fitting way, pulverizing the defensive towers. While spheres of magma soar overhead, Zatan dives into the midst of the enemy garrison and eviscerates them while our heroes support the rapid capture of the walls. Bull centaurs and flying taurus cut off reinforcing cavalry with brutal violence. The battle to burst, the barrier keeping carriages out of Cathay, rapidly progresses to close quarters street fighting, with the defenders erecting barricades and blockages to stem the tide of half-sized chaos. These defenses serve as nothing more than target practice, and the defenders find themselves being incinerated by both bombardment and black magic. It becomes clear that a final stand is being prepared in the highest courtyard overlooking the city, and the first of our forces to find their way there meet stiff resistance. A cavalry charge and withering fire from defensive towers quickly routes the blunderbusses, while a valorous vanguard of dwarf warriors pins down several enemy units deep in the castle's rear. In the lower reaches of the settlement, however, the defenders are already vanquished and our forces organize for the final battle. As columns of fiery fighters charge up the hills, tanking the desperate ranged attacks of the remaining towers, Zatan bursts onto the Cathayan formation and decimates their artillery. As the besiegers form ranks and push the remaining garrison, their resolve shatters and the day is ours. Having taken possession of the gateway to Cathay, our most fearsome, unthinkable weapon rumbles forward. From the shadowy Northlands comes an army of trains to claim its dreadful prize of carnage and slaughter. Immediately after passing into Cathay, we laser focus on an out of position communist baggage train on its way back from killing peasants for eating food. Socialists like to pride themselves on their high kill count of people living under socialism. Well, we're here to burst that bubble explosively. The socialist despoilers spot the advancing plumes of locomotive exhaust and realize that they're in for a treat, hurriedly taking up defensive positions in apparently advantageous terrain. They aim to cut off the unfamiliar machines at a choke point. Because communists can't understand logistics, it comes as no surprise that they have arranged themselves in precisely the formation which an army of rampaging cannon trains would hope for. What follows would be unfit for even the campiest gore flick, as hundreds of former farmers fertilize their fields for a final flourishing. The hellstorm of Dreadquake Ordnance leaves nothing but scattered and terrified tree growers by the time the flattening front line of freight flies through the fuming fragments. Skullcrackers with whirling buzzsaws and thrusting thorns burst through the smoke and quickly rout the survivors. Although this should have been the end of our first step in crushing Cathay, the nearby settlement's garrison had taken notice of the engagement and sallied out to assist their ambushed allies. The reinforcements rapidly realized they were as unprepared as the soldiers who were ahead of them in line for deletion. Before they had time to organize into any kind of formation, 40 locomotives rolled over them like Soviet citizens after hearing about a grocery store that actually had food. Ladies and gentlemen, the crushing of Cathay has begun. Seeing no reason to waste good suffering, our trains turn to the nearest settlement large enough to deserve their attention and attack. Apparently victims of their own shoddy construction practices, the walls were already riddled with collapses. Mercifully, standing still, which is part of the whole defending thing, is basically the most efficient way of guaranteeing that this army takes you out in as little time as possible. Before our chomping melee trains could pass through the breaches, the mortars had already reduced the defenders to smoldering ash. By now, the writing was already on the wall for collectivism. If Cathay could not soon muster a meaningful defense, the campaign will end with much less resistance than it began. Settlements near the fallen northern bastions are rapidly ground to dust as a worthy opponent is sought.
With the majority of the northern forces literally backed into a corner, a decisive conflict seemed inevitable. With the luxury of choice snatched away from the defenders, a siege is initiated and the noose begins its final tightening around the Nangao pocket. The barrier-busting skullcrackers surge ahead, foul augmentations propelling them forward with a burst of speed. Behind them, twelve mortars rain absolute destruction on the inhabitants of the city, with entire units of 120 soldiers wiped out in single volleys. The melee machines upcycle unarmored infantrymen into carbon emissions, while squads of mortar engines push through deep into the city. Overhead, Zatan and his Taurus entourage head for the primary capture point, simply to add to the confusion and terror of the defenders, their shadows passing over retreating Cathayans like the specter of death. Desperate lancers and halberdiers swarm the skullcrackers which remain behind as the mortars rush to their next objectives within the interior. As the communist commanders treat their underlings like cannon fodder, it would feel inappropriate to waste this opportunity to manifest the metaphor literally, and our cannons cannibalize the starving socialists in a manner most ironic. Sections of the city from which the Chaos Convoy is not even visible are not spared from the devastation, as mortars the size of a Volvo crash into enemy forces from above. The only threat to our locomotives within the settlement quickly makes herself known, as Mao Ying assumes her dragon form and intercepts one of the mortars in transit. Now is the time to reveal the purpose of our bovine entourage, as Zatan and his two powerful beasts ambush the now revealed Storm Dragon and bring a brutally swift end to its presence on the battlefield. The final battalion of defenders form ranks in the inner courtyards of the fortress, and our mortal engines array themselves in the opposite. Although a climactic final confrontation seemed in order, a tidal wave of burning obliteration sweeps the Cathayans aside bringing an end to the northern resistance. The crushing of Cathay was as if we had kicked the door in and the entire rotten structure simply collapsed. However, history would advise us that communist states may, like roaches, bounce back from even the most disastrous openings. Of course, in that historical example, their invaders were also socialists, which explains their own lack of effectiveness. Socialism is a disadvantage we do not suffer from, we have also elected to redefine the meaning of scorched earth policy. Where this term has traditionally described the practice of destroying your own land as you retreat from an invader, we have chosen instead to immolate our enemy's lands ourselves as we conquer them, transforming the once underutilized wilderness of Cathay into a fuming smog of industrial fire. Nothing inhabits these lands now other than ourselves, our slaves, and the retreating armies of vanquished foes. To finish our campaign and bring a close to our story of industry and innovation, our train speeds south, conquering settlements with ease and leaving nothing but strip mines and billowing forges in their wake. As we find ourselves occupying the southern provinces, ultimately ending up at Hanyu port, it becomes clear that under the might of rail and piston, Cathay has simply collapsed. But it does seem peculiar that we have yet to encounter Zhao Ming, the Iron Dragon. Sure enough, he appears in a nearby settlement, forced out by our relentless pressure. Being the only army yet mustered by the socialists, with any noteworthy units, it is decided that eradicating the Iron Dragon's forces shall be our final test. The communists beg for peace, knowing that their days of economic illiteracy are coming to an end. We know better than to succumb to this seduction, however, for the comrades never truly abandon their utopian excuses for barbarism. Thus, the fateful final battle is launched deep in the southern lands of Cathay, where destiny shall be decided. Squads of three locomotives are spread out to every potential entryway on the eastern flank of the settlement, while a few flanking engines are dispatched to the western half. A sight of raining hellfire now familiar to the Cathayans announces the hostilities as the entire host of nearly 40 engines rumble into the streets of Shangwu. The garrison finds itself rapidly disintegrating under this immense pressure while Xiao Ming desperately attempts to maintain order. Bolsheviks discover flight for the first time as exploding ordnance sends their individual bits collectively soaring, 
As Zatan hastily takes the entire enemy battery of artillery out of action, a specialized fire-breathing tank enters the courtyard, melting an entire enemy unit in a single demonic explosion of violence. Although the mortal slaves of Chairman Zhao are swept aside effortlessly, Hell hath no fury like a communist who is prevented from stealing other people's property. The only thing more powerful than a communist's need to steal, the Iron Dragon taps into his innate need to abandon his followers to their deaths and flees for his life. Unfortunately for Zhao Ming, every mortar in the entire army is now trained on his position, while Zatan's trusty net is ready to be used again and again until the problem is finally resolved. And so, with the undoing of dictatorship, the tale of how short, disorderly lads used industry to overcome the shortcomings of communism draws to a close. I have been informed by subject matter experts that by owning slaves, we were actually doing a socialism ourselves. While I take some time to reflect on the folly of believing the ends justified the means, I encourage you to participate in the market distribution of economic information. By liking this video and subscribing to my channel, like any responsible entrepreneur, demand encourages me to create more supply. Until next time, Praximus out.